Praise the Lord, everyone, wherever you are. We're here together in Jesus' name on his day. And we want you to know that many of you have been in our prayers during the week. And if you ever want to hear a sermon a preacher preaches to herself, stay awake because I'm preaching to myself a lot. And I know it will bless you too because some of you have been going through some things. So let us all stand and welcome the presence of the Lord. And I pray that you'll put all your worries and all your cares aside because Jesus cares for you. He does. You're going to get out of this service what you allow him to put into you. And he says he's able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that you ask or even think. So ask big. He's a big, big, wonderful God. And he will meet your needs. So pray for one another. And let's welcome the presence of the Lord. We'd like to extend our uh, prayers in sympathy to Carter Curry. He, his sister was promoted to heaven uh, yesterday, I believe it was. So let's remember their family. And then uh, Davina and Dallasai uh, left for the Philippines, and they're going to be there for about six months. So pray for her healing and pray that everything would go well with their business and stuff that's on this side. But continue to pray for them every day because they need the Lord's help. We need to also pray for our sister Lay, and we ask that you will just lift her up to she needs a lot of prayer. And there's so many unspoken requests people have sent in that we have on our heart uh, that we're not, you know, free to share it. It's between us and God. But you know, just to lift up God, when you're praying in the spirit, he will tell you what to pray. So um, pray for those who are new in the faith. They're transiting from their old life to the new life and a lot of changes. They, some of them need housing and most of them need God's peace and strength to go through with the commitment they've made to the Lord. And we'd like for you to be here tonight because I've convinced Lionel Barrezzo to be interviewed. I don't know if he's going to sing. I haven't convinced him of that yet. But we're going to have a nice interview and testimony uh, from the Barrezzo's tonight. So be here at 7 o'clock. Let's welcome the Lord now. Bow your heads in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you because this is a day that you have made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. And we thank you, Father, for emptying us of ourselves and filling us with your Holy Spirit. Prepare hearts to receive your life-giving word, your word of hope, your word of mercy, your word of loving kindness, Lord. We look to you for our strength. And so we pray for these. We pray for Davina and Dallasai. We pray, Lord, for Lay. We thank you, Lord, that you're the same yesterday, today, and forever. We pray for Carter's family, that you will give peace. And we're so glad that his sister know you. And our hope is heaven. And so we thank you for her life. And we ask for your divine comfort. And for these who are really in some painful situations, you said to come unto you, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and you promise to give us rest. So during this service, may we be nourished in our spirit. May we find our rest in you and victory through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Smile at somebody behind your mask and let them know you're glad that they're here. Every praise, every praise to 
praise, every praise, every praise is to our God. Hallelujah. We bless your name this morning, Lord. Join us as we continue praising the Lord as we welcome his presence to this place. Come into his presence with thanksgiving in your heart and give him praise. Come into His presence with thanksgiving in your heart. Your voice is raised. Your voice is raised in glory and honor. Bye. 
time we'll be receiving our offering. Mm -hmm. Gloria. Amen. Praise God. The Lord reigneth. Amen. Do you feel like God is reigning in your life? Amen. Well, praise the Lord. It's time for us to give. And I asked the question, why do we give to the Lord? What is the importance of giving to the Lord? So last week we looked at um, Malachi chapter 3 verse 10 that says, bringing all the tithe into the storehouse, there, there may be food in my house, says the Lord. Amen. And so I took from there and went on to share why we bring the tithe and offering into the Lord. You know, God, in all the years that I'm living and as I'm getting older, I realize when God says something, there's usually a practical reason for why he says something. God is not the type of God that sits on the throne and says, like our parents used to say, do it because I said so. Did your parents say that? Do it, just do it because I said so. God is not like that. God has a purpose and a plan. So one of the, he says, bring all the tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. The word of God feeds our spirit. Amen? The word of God, John chapter 6, verse 63 says, it is the, it is the spirit that gives life. The flesh is no help. The words that I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. Amen? We looked at that last week also. So for us to receive the life of God, it comes through the word of God. And so when we bring the, the tithe into the storehouse, we're providing a place where people could come and get spiritual food for their spiritual life. Amen? How practical is that? It takes um, money to put, pay the electric bill for the lights. It takes money to have air conditioning. Amen? So God is practical. He says, bring the first of what you earn, 10%. I'm only going to ask you for 10%. But when you bring the 10% and plus what you feel generous out of your heart, I'm going to put a blessing on the 90%. Amen? I'm going to stretch the 90%. And he also says, you, in your lifetime, will not have enough room to receive it. And then he tells us that we can prove him on it. So when you, if you're paying your tithe and your offering, and you're faithful with it, consistent, when, when, if you don't see the blessing and the increase, you can go to God and say, Lord, you know, I'm a tither. I, you said that I could prove you on this. And so we can... We can ask the Lord. We could come to the Lord for the increase that we, we think we deserve. Isn't God good? God is a good God. So I just encourage you, bring your tithe into the storehouse. Bring your offering. God is a, he, he's not a, an addition God. He's a multiplication God. <laughs> you can't put your money in the bank and get multiplied interest on it. No, they give you what, 0.1%, 0.1% on your savings? God said, no, no, bring it to me. I'm going to multiply it back to you. Amen? Good um, 30, 60, and 100% full is God going to give back to us. So we can't go wrong. Amen? So, Father, we just thank you for the opportunity, Lord, that you have given us to be a part of the kingdom, to be actual players in the kingdom that we could bring our finances into your kingdom that we could bring our offering into your kingdom and we know that you are faithful God so I pray a blessing on everyone under the sound of my voice that is sowing their seed today that's given their tithes Lord that you will bless them Lord not only in finances but in health in strength in peace father we just thank you Lord for all that you give to us and we thank you for the blessing of the tithe in Jesus name and everyone said amen, amen.
Are you longing to worship the Lord? You know, God wants us to come in his presence. And my message today is going to be, why do we need to love God, you know? Uh, and I'm going to explain to you why this speaks to me. But I want us to really fully give God attention as we worship him. This is a gift from us to him. A gift cannot be bought. A gift cannot be earned, but I think God has earned our worship. And he alone is to be worshiped. And our worship has to be holy. And we're learning about that, aren't we? So today, whatever I know, some of you have been crying for almost all week. You've got some very, very serious challenges. But you've hung in there. You've hung in there. So to me, in the process of the journey, you're a winner today. You may not feel like a winner. I'm going to tell you some of my sad stories a little bit so you're going to feel sorry for me. <laughs> then you can cry for me instead of crying for yourself, okay? But you know when we serve the Lord, I heard a preacher say this week, Christianity is the only religion that gives you joy. Only religion that gives you joy. And Peter said, joy unspeakable and full of glory. And Nehemiah said, I think I gave it to you the other night, the joy of the Lord is my strength. So I've been trying to pump out joy today, you know, <laughs> because I need strength, you know what I'm saying? And so do you. But when we come into his presence, and worship him. We're connecting with God Almighty and do it with joy, not a reluctance, but with tremendous joy because he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He owns everything but your worship, but your worship. That's why it's very precious to him when we honor him in spirit and in truth. So as we sing these wonderful songs, let's imagine ourselves walking into the very throne room of God and looking into his face and giving him this gift of worship. Amen.
Kheria vasira nara mukho Orendes jara vore khestai Orendes jara raya la vasira raya la vasira Orendes jara raya la vasira Alleluia Alleluia We cast our feet ourselves at your feet Lord Jesus you're worthy of our praise and our worship fill this tabernacle with your glory Lord fill our hearts with your glory fill our hearts with your peace oh touch Lord touch the brokenhearted touch the sick ones Touch the discouraged ones. Touch those have, that have no peace. Touch the weak. Let them be strong. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Let's love him once more. not been able to eat you've lost your appetite it could be because you've been sick or it could be that you don't know why I command that spirit of death to leave you and I pray life into you your appetite will be restored for good things that will bring you life and health thank you Lord Somebody with ankle problems, God is delivering you. Somebody with ear problems, like ringing in your ears, God is delivering you. Receive it. Somebody with a kink in your neck, God is touching you. Praise Him. Receive it. The Holy Spirit knows exactly what you need. Somebody needed faith for me to speak that out, but you can call your own need out to Him. And he said he will hear you. So tell him what you need right now in this time of worship, of bringing to him our gift. He likes to return it by giving you the desires of your heart. Surrender to him. Surrender. Somebody's having a very difficult time to surrender to the Lord. Give him all. All. Just say, Jesus, I don't know what all means, but I give you my all. Take it all. Take it all. 
Let that burden of guilt and sin and depression and confusion go in Jesus' name. By the power of the Holy Spirit, we deliver you in Jesus' name from the oppression of the enemy. We stand to lift God's word and declare it upon you. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And if you're an outsider looking in, you can be part of the family as we break, break, break bread today in Jesus' name. Just say, Lord Jesus, I'm an outsider looking in, but it sure looks good around your table. Please forgive me of my sins. I acknowledge that you went to the cross and took the punishment for my sins that I might live. Thank you, Lord. I'll be eternally grateful. And I invite you to come into my heart right now. I give my life to you. Write my name in your book of life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And Father, for everyone who sincerely said that prayer, I can see the angels writing their names in that book. I can see peace between you and this one who's finally come home. I see heaven all rejoicing. You said when one comes into the kingdom, there's great rejoicing in heaven. And so we rejoice here too, in Jesus' name. Amen. And let's give him a clap offering. Amen. A big clap offering, Lord, for all that you've done, for all that you've done in and through us and around us. We praise you. We're awed by your love for us and your power to rescue us. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Amen. I told you that I'm going to be preaching a sermon that I'm preaching to myself, okay? And a lot of times after I do the Facebook, I kind of watch it to see where I can improve or if something went wrong. But I'm going to play this one over because I think the Holy Ghost is going to be speaking to me, okay? I, I know everybody had a hard week, and uh, while you're listening to my gibberish, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and we're going to read verses 12 and 13. That's going to be our start, but get your pen and pencil and paper or your journal and write these scriptures down because you're going to need it as I need it. I've got it all in my notes right here, so I'm going to take it home and med meditate it on it again. But, you know, uh, last Sunday when I stood up and preached, I told everybody that's around me on the team, I said, that was a miracle that my voice did not crack or whatever because I've been talking a lot, and don't say amen, I, I talk a lot. And, uh, you know, I had been very busy. I had a God assignment, and I know every time you have a God assignment, Satan is there to battle it. But I didn't think that the battle was going to be so uh, severe okay so if you think you've had a battle the reason why I'm telling you my problems is that your battles are not going to seem so great perhaps if you cry with me okay I've been crying with some of you so I want you to cry with me okay but last Sunday I thought it was like victory I had this book assignment to write it needed to be done you know by midsummer then they tell me it's going to take four months and we scrambled around some of you heard the story we finally found a publisher that could publish it in two weeks and we thought it was a miracle but the thing about it is their staff the, the, the whole publishing company have their assignments already and in order for them to print the book we had to do a lot of the editing. So we did the editing, and we sent, and the other publishing company had done a lot, you know. And so we send it off. We get it back. Oh, it's the wrong typeset. You've got to type it all over, the whole manuscript over. So we typed the whole, you see how depressed you get now? You're getting depressed with me? Okay, good, okay. So anyway, so we had to type the whole thing over in another, you know, uh, format and whatever. When we looked it over, no capital letters. So we had to go and capitalize all the thing. Now you're getting more depressed? Okay, good. You know, and, and so we did this and we worked hard. And as I said, it started from last Sunday that I was losing my voice and I was getting tired and weary of this project. And uh, so this week we worked all really hard for that. And then one day, I don't know if it was Monday or Tuesday, we finally sent it out. And 
James sent me a, a big hallelujah, praise the Lord, it's finally over, we sent it. And so I said, yes, praise the Lord, hallelujah, in big capital letters. So we were rejoicing in the Lord, finally over. But I got something else to make you more depressed, so stay awake. The next morning, I get a phone call from the publisher. And I said, hello, I hope it's good news. She said, I don't know what the bad news now. There's so many things that happen. She said, you're going to have to do this and do whatever. And so I called James and said, we got to do this. Okay, so anyway, Carol was helping us, and Jolly came to help us. And we were doing all of this. And then I think it was like Friday. I cannot remember now. But uh, anyway, toward the end of the week, we were working really, really hard. And James and I hardly slept for two nights. I think Thursday night and Friday night, we hardly slept. Are you feeling depressed now? Those of you who have not been able to sleep, we went through that. We couldn't sleep. Okay, so Friday night, I think it was, early in the morning, uh, we were working hard. I, my eyes are burning. I went home. James was there. Got up early in the morning. I was looking for James. Uh, Carol had gone to work. And I called Carol. I said, I cannot find James around. And we've got, we've got an 11 o'clock a deadline, this is on Friday, we got an 11 o'clock deadline, I cannot find him. She said, well, when I left, I saw his car out there, so he must be sleeping in one of the rooms. So, you know, I said, well, I don't know. She said, could be this room, that room, and whatever. And I was so desperate. It was like 8 o'clock in the morning. We got three more hours before the deadline. Are you getting depressed now? Really depressed? Okay, good. And so, you know, finally... I I said, Lord, I don't know what to do. I don't know where he is. He's not answering his phone. He's not answering the text. He's not answering anything. So I got our Sunday school bell. You know the big Sunday school bell? Like the Santa Claus bell? I went around this church ringing the bell. James! James! Are you sleeping? James, I need you. <laughs> Up and down the stairs. So you know whenever you have a problem, you want to blame somebody? So today I blame James that I hardly have strength to walk to the pulpit. I, I went all around. And then James is going to blame me because what happened was he was going to take a break, go home. He went out and the battery of this car was dead. That's why the car was here. And you know what he had to do? He didn't have to do it. He could have knocked on my door, but I guess he knew how tired I was. He walked home all the way to Kahului in the dark. I said, James. He said, really? I felt more awake when I got home than when I was sitting over here. So we're blaming each other. Okay, so anyway, that has been our week. And we still have one more, maybe today. By midnight, I need to submit it for sure. And my sister, June, she's working hard on it. Uh, she was a school teacher, so she's good at text reading and correcting, and, and other people have helped us there, too. So if you're feeling really depressed, good. You know, some of you are too happy. I tell you what, and then I say this because sometimes people think pastors don't have any problems. I'm already always smiling. Let me tell you what, this morning it was kind of a fake smile, you know? I can hardly smile, <laughs> but I got to show up, right? Now, it, I, now I got the joy of the Lord. In fact, during the worship time, I told James, if I go to the bathroom and don't come back, it's because I'm resting over there. I am so tired to so take over, okay? But then as we started praising the Lord, let me tell you people, don't run away from the presence of God. Don't run away from the presence of God. I came back and we sang and we praised the Lord and the joy of the Lord is my strength and I thank the Lord that I have my voice back and I can preach. Okay, so thank you, Jesus. I want to thank the Lord for that. But let me tell you what the practical lesson I learned myself, okay, before I go into the lesson that, you know, I was very physically tired. It's been a long time. We've been doing this, working on it, so focused on this project that everything else was kind of like a blur. Take a good rest sometimes. When you don't have physical rest, you make wrong decisions. Accidents can happen. God made us body, soul, and spirit. So this week, I said that sad story to announce that, don't bother me, okay? <laughs> I don't want to talk, so don't call me. I'm still good at texting, although I got a new telephone, and sometimes 
a bad word comes out. I have to rebuke it and go correct it. So if a bad word comes out, it's not intentional, okay? Forgive me. Or it repeats the whole paragraph. I got to find out how, I got to get rid of that. Anyway, but you know, seriously, during this pandemic, I think God has slowed us down. But don't get busy with things that are not important. Our bodies are not machines. We're gonna, I'm going over some things that will include that, but our bodies are not machines because I made small little wrong decisions until I almost collapsed yesterday. You know, there's a tugging in your spirit that said, don't do this or do this or whatever. And you're so tired, you just kind of go with the flow and your discernment. And then the other thing is, because I've been so busy, I have not had my quiet time with the Lord as I should. Uh, way before, when I first started my ministry almost, the Lord told me, give your mornings to me till 10 o'clock. And so I did my worship, I did my study, you know, and my time with him. But the last two weeks, it, it's been neglected because I had deadlines, you know. So we need to rest our bodies we need to make time for the time with the Lord. Don't cheat yourself. I cheated myself by not spending time with the Lord. And so his voice to me got dimmer and dimmer, really, until toward the end out of my tiredness, I did this and that, and I regret now doing it. But I'm telling you this, if you don't remember anything else, don't neglect your time with the Lord and take care of your body, soul, and spirit. We're going to talk about in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 12 and 13. Now you can quit being depressed. We're going to the word of God and get raised up. Father, we thank you. Yes, all of us go through times of testing and stretching and many times we use that, not willfully perhaps as a reason to neglect you, but I confess that I've neglected my time with you. I ask for your forgiveness. I pray that you will restore me even as I preach, that the Holy Spirit will encourage me and teach me more lessons. In Jesus' name, amen. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, remember? I said that this is a book that St. Paul had to go correct the Corinthian church because they were going wild, full of the Holy Spirit, you know? You remember the time when you first feel of the Holy Spirit and you did some wild things later on? You said, well, that really was not of God. Well, St. Paul wrote this letter to correct some of those unbiblical things. When we say that after we are born again, we need to be discipled, that's exactly what it means. Our time needs to be discipled. Our bodies need to be discipled, like what we eat and how we sleep and how we exercise. we got to bring it under the subjection of Jesus Christ. And so our minds need to be discipled where we no longer want to watch bad things. But we want to see the Word of God, read the Word of God watch movies about the word of God or good Christian movies. You know, we, we need to disciple our minds. Some of you are saying, oh, I've got flashbacks. Let me tell you what, put it under the blood of Jesus and immediately rebuke it in Jesus' name and put it under the blood and get into the word. I'm telling people, and they, they tell me this, because, you know, I know how hard it is. I say, memorize God's word. Oh, pastor, you don't know how old I am. I have a hard time memorizing Okay, but let me tell you this, even if you don't memorize it word for word, what you're doing is retraining your brain that was fed by your five senses that was sensual and, and carnal and fleshly, you know? And you're reprogramming your mind to be under the obedience of Christ. And even if you don't know it word for word, believe me, when you need it, it's going to pop up and you're going to remember that scripture because your mind has been reprogrammed. So force yourself every day, especially if you're having problems, to try to memorize a scripture or two. And even if you can't say it perfectly, Know that your brain has been retrained, and the next morning do a review, so by the end of the week you have five or six 
scriptures to review and your mind is slowly being renewed. Okay. So, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 12 and 13 says this. Therefore, when we say therefore, it means that there was something before that, kind of warfare, spiritual warfare, going after the things of the world, lusting after the things of the world. It says, therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. There's so many that were feeling they're very spiritual and not vulnerable to falling. And so St. Paul says, let him who thinks he stands, if you think you're more spiritual than somebody else, you're very dangerous. You're very dangerous to yourself. Take heed lest he fall. This is a warning from the Lord. Okay. And then there's an encouragement. He says, no temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. That means you're the only one. You're not the only one that's going through what you're going through. One of the, the lies of Satan is to say, oh, you poor thing. Nobody has had a life like you. You can throw a pity party and you can feel sorry for yourself. And God's word says, hey, there's no temptation, no, no test that is overtaking you, overtaking you, that means you almost lost it, except such as common to man. So if you look around this congregation and you're going through something, you know that somebody probably sitting right beside you has gone through the same thing. They may not you know, tell you that. It may not be clothed in the same colors and so forth, but quite similar because that's what God says. We all as human beings have temptations and test. The temptations are in our areas of weakness. The devil will tempt us. So if you have a temptation, know that it's your weakness and you need to give it to the Lord and ask God to strengthen you in that area and don't feed that temptation. If you've got problems with pornography, you know, and it's an addiction, I know some of you are struggling with that. Well, we need to cast it down, we need to renew our mind, and we know that, you know, just about everybody has had that problem, right? Even me. I watch the news or watch something, and there's this, I cannot believe the things that they're advertising now. I live all by myself, but I hold, hold my head down like this, like, I'm surprised they're advertising this in such a sensual way, right? we got to cut it off, chain channel, cut it off completely or whatever. You've got to guard your own soul. You know where your temptation is. I might watch through the whole thing and hate it, but it won't affect me because that is not my weakness. So recognize your weakness and then ask God to strengthen you. Don't keep on making excuses. Well, you know, I have that weakness. I have that weakness. 20 years from now, you're going to be saying, you know, I have that weakness. That's why God is there. That's why we love him. He's there with us through our temptations. And it says, there's no temptation overtaking you such as is common to men, but God. Isn't that wonderful? Think about incidences in your life and you can say, but God is faithful. God is faithful. Underline that in your Bible. Make your Bible a useful tool for you. Mark it all over. Scriptures that mean something. Scriptures you perceive you will need in the future. Mark it. God is faithful. Who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able. That means he's not going to give you something. If you're trusting in him now. If you don't trust in him, you're trusting the devil. You're already on the wrong side, so you're defeated already. But as you continue, as weak as you are, as frail as you are, as scared as you are, you know, if you continue to put your trust in the Lord, God is faithful, and he will not give you any more than you can bear. Yesterday, I thought I had more than I could bear. And then I came here and I had even more than I could bear. You know what I'm saying? I went home so upset. And then God says, it's not more than you can bear. Trust me. 
I will teach you something from this. So he stretches us, but he will not give us any more than he can bear. We can bear. Why? Because he's there alongside cast, uh, carrying it for us, right? He said, cast your care upon me. I will care. So we have a care. We have a temptation. We have a problem. Jesus is walking beside you. We're going to tell you later that in 1 John it says he is in you. So you're not alone. So whatever, if you are trusting him, and that's what is our problem. Do you have an enemy called Mr. Will? Oh, he could be a friend, Mr. Will. My will trips me up. Will accompanies me everywhere. God has given me a will. Precious gift that can negate every promise that God has given me and can fulfill every plan that Satan has for me. This is election year. John 10, 10 says, Satan, the thief, comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But I am come that you might have life and life more abundantly. But you make the choice. Some of you are living victoriously. Some of you are living in defeat. It's Mr. Will that's tripping you up. What did you do with your will? You have the choice. God, because he loves us, is not going to force you to go to heaven, you know? He gives you a choice. He gave you the gift of his son. He sent his son to die on the cross for your sins, your punishment, your death. Nobody can say, God doesn't love me. Well, look to the cross. God doesn't care for me. Look at the empty cross. It is hope for you if you choose. If you choose. Each one of us makes the decision for ourselves. You cannot blame it on your wife or your husband or your children or your parents or your grandparents or me. You make your own Choices. God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape. Just think, if you were a sinister spy in a foreign country and you know they're coming to get you, what do you have to do? I've never been a spy. I've never watched too many spy movies, but instinctively, I think, I'll be quiet. They're looking for me. Got to be quiet. And you know, if in this time of your life, you feel like you're overwhelmed and you're looking for a way of escape, be quiet. Be quiet. Even sometimes turn off the praise and worship thing. Praise and worship is from you to God. I think many of us need to develop the communication from God to us. We don't listen enough. Help me, God. Help me get out of this. And he's telling you, but you're too busy, and you ran away from where he delivered the, the plan, plan of escape. Be still. He said, be still and know that I am God. How many of you run around too much? You're too busy. Well, maybe this time of testing is when God is slowing you down and said, you're going too far away from me, stop. And you're in a place where so uncomfortable because you're busy. You, you feel like by being busy, you're accomplishing something, but sometimes you get yourself in more trouble. So he said, stop. Will those of you out there just be grateful for where you are today, this morning? Because God is telling you, stop. When we were kids, they, they had this song. Stop and let me tell you what the good Lord's done for me. Stop. He's got a way of escape. He's telling you. 
Sometimes it will come through a friend. Sometimes it will come, hopefully, from the pastor. Sometimes it's going to come, you know, but listen to the right voice because many voices will tell you this way or that way. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, the life. I will not deceive you. When I say this is the way to escape, go that way. That's the right way. Even if it seems so difficult, just follow him. But many of you, God has put a stop sign on your life. And I think as a society, the whole world has had to stop. And God is saying, I'm speaking to you. I'm speaking to you. And I think what he's saying is you're going the wrong way. Turn around. Go the opposite way. That's what repent means. You're going straight to hell. Stop. You have had no time for me. You don't know who I am. Stop. Listen to me. I love you. I love you so much. I paid the penalty for the sins that you've committed so you don't have to go to hell with the devil who made your life miserable here on earth. I always say, why would you want to spend eternity with the one that made your life so miserable? Be wise. Be smart. Today is a day of salvation. Turn around. Jesus is saying, this is the way of escape. You want an escape from your problems? Jesus is the way. He said, I will make the way that you will be able to bear it. You'll be able to bear it. Some of us, we don't like pain. I'm actually kind of pain tolerant. I've had some things happen, and I'm not really afraid of pain. And maybe I haven't had the kind of pain you've had. You know, like right now, I've got a tooth here that the doctor wanted to extract before the pandemic. Then they canceled everything. And so I'm wondering if I'm going to have to do it. And it started to shake, so I I think I can pull it out myself. I can save me $400 if I could, you know. And and I've gone through some pain, and uh, Brother Paul offered to do it because he saw it done on TV. (laughs) Stay away from that dangerous man. Okay. Don't sneeze or cough or choke. Oh, he loves to have choking people. He knows how to make a, what do you call that, tracheotomy or something. Okay, stay away from him. Then it ends up by saying here, therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. We want the blessings of the Lord, but we don't want instructions many times on how to get the blessings and the promises of God. Okay, he said, you're going through what everybody else has gone through, but I am faithful and I'm able to deliver you and I will make a way of escape. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. But wait. My beloved, you can have all of that if you flee idolatry. Okay. For you new ones and everybody, turn to Exodus chapter 20. This is where the Ten Commandments are found. The children of Israel had been delivered from 400 years as slaves in Egypt. They crossed the Red Sea and they had... Had they followed the instruction of God, they could have made it to the promised land in eight or ten days. But instead, they said, well, we better go see how it is. You know, they didn't trust God. And ten of the spies, as you know, came back and said, oh, there are giants in the land. We could never defeat them. And so two, Joshua and and, um, Caleb, said, you know what? We've got God. Remember your three Hebrew children? God is going to help us. We've got God. David, when he faced the giant, oh, yeah, I'm looking pretty small to that giant, but I'm under a covenant. You're under a covenant too, okay? But they came in, and they started to then yearn back. They said, Moses, why did you bring us here? They forget that they rebelled against God, and they did not go into the promised land as God wanted to and they could have done it in eight or ten days. They spent 40 years in the wilderness. We can learn from this. If you don't want to spend 40 years in the wilderness, then obey God and trust him. Trust him. Trust him. It looks like they got a lot of giants, but if he says go there, just go there and trust him. But these rebelled, and you know, every adult that rebelled, the whole generation of them died in the wilderness and did not see the promised land. It was the second generation under Joshua 
one of the good spies that went into the promised land. But here in the 20th chapter, when we talk about turn from idolatry, it may not mean too much for you, so I want us to kind of explain it. Verse 2 says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Does it sound like some of us? You were recently in the land of bondage. You were a slave to sin. You thought there was no way out but God. But Jesus came. And you accepted his gift of salvation and eternal life. And you're set free. You were delivered out of the house of bondage. And this is the direction the Ten Commandments really give the direction, the way to stay delivered, okay? To stay under the covenant blessings of God. It says, number one, thou shall have no other gods before me. No other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation. And I know that word jealous kind of got your ears up, meaning that God says, I am protecting you and I will not have interference from anybody else if you trust me. I'm jealous over you. Why? Is it an evil kind of jealousy? No, it's a protective kind of love over you that we can understand when he says that. Okay. So, how many of you have a cat like this in your business? One time I visited a home and they had a very sick daughter. And you know me, I, I just tell it like it is, not in a mean way, but they were desperate. Walked into the big living room area and they had three cats like this in their house. And so I prayed over the house and the daughter and, and all of them. And uh, as I'm going out, I said, uh, why do you have those? Oh, um, Somebody gave him. I said, do you know that God considers that an idol? And if you want help from God, you must get rid of them. Somebody just told me, Pastor, if I don't do what you say, will you still love me? <laughs> You're so strict that I don't know if I can. I said, I will still love you. But I'm strict only because I go by the word of God. If I step out of the will of God and just say, you know, don't do this, don't do that, well, you don't have to do it. But if you find it in God's word, my job is to get you to heaven. My job is to get you to heaven. If you think I'm so strict, I want to remind you that the Bible says, broad is the way that goes to hell. And narrow is the way. And I'm not teaching my own thing. I'm teaching Jesus' way, so he, I think he's pretty strict because he doesn't want any unrighteousness there. But you know, I wanted their daughter to get healed. I wanted peace in that family and so forth, you know. And they refused to get it because it was a gift from special friends. Let me tell you what. That's idolatry. That thing is idolatry, and the friends that gave it became idols to them so that they could not throw it away. They revered the friendship of their friends that gave that gift, then God. Pretty strict. But God says this, if you want me to be your God, he says, I am the God, okay? And I want you to be blessed, but don't bow down to them. You know, I have some people who get newly converted, maybe from the Buddhist church, and, and then they're, you know, faced with this, that they have the urn, and they go through there, and they call by the families, come and bow. I said, you just go and stand and, and show your respect, but don't bow. We don't bow. We show our respect. You don't have to make a scene, but don't bow, because the Lord says, we shall not bow 
over them, and he says that he will show mercy to thousands of us as we obey him. Okay, number one, he says, love me. In Matthew chapter 23, I believe is, and verses 36 to 40. Matthew chapter 23, verses 36 to 40. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. How many of you love the promises of God that say, I will give you all that you need? You like that? Well, in exchange, he wants all of you. Fair. Fair. Because if you do for God what you can, he will do for you what you cannot do for yourself because he's God and you're a mere human being. So he says, give me your all, which is just a little like a little bag full of whatever you have, and I will give you my kingdom. That's what he promised. Everything that is in his kingdom is ours if we give him our all. So when you think of your little suitcase full of all your belongings, one time when I was early ministry, you know, a preacher came and, and was talking about giving our all. And after that, we were having lunch. And I said, you know what? I have no problem giving my all because the only thing I own in my house is my refrigerator. That's the only possession I had at that time. I didn't have a car. I didn't have anything else. I could give him my refrigerator. That's my all. But when you have much, you know, in this world, I know it's difficult. But compare it to take you that way. But I believe if we're smart, we will let God have our way. He says, love me with all of your heart. This is the first and great commandment. Then he says, and the second, all of the Ten Commandments and all the prophets said are hung on these two verses that Jesus is saying now, love God with all of your heart, all of your mind, all of your soul, and love your neighbor as yourself. You know why we need to love ourselves? I find that people who don't love themselves cannot love somebody else. When they don't love themselves, not meaning, you know, well, I'm so wonderful, I'm so you know, it's not that kind of love. That means respect who you are. You're made in the image of God. You are a child's purpose in heaven that he planted in your mother's womb, and you've got a purpose to fill, and you know it. If you don't fulfill it, you're empty, you're searching. Love God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Well, the word fearfully in the King James says awesome, okay? Some of you look like, yeah, you are fearfully and wonderful made. I saw that under your mask, okay. We're awesomely made. I appreciate this. This is why you should not mutilate your body. This is why you should take care of your body. You are the temple. All the other commandments hang on these. In 1 John 4, it tells us, verses 19 and 21, it says, we love him because he first loved us. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. Why? God says, love me with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Love your brother, your neighbor as yourself. But if you say, I love God and hate my brother, he, it says here, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother, Victor, I love you. I love you so much. You're my number one brother. He's the only one I have, okay? God whom he has not seen. God is telling us this. You boast that you love me? Well, love each other. I see how much you love me by how you love the next person. But he's able to give us the strength. And this commandment we have from him that he who loves God must love his brother also. And if you're marking your Bible, underline the word must because sometimes we think it's multiple choice. You want the blessings of God? Follow him. Love your brother. It doesn't say that you had a good brother or a bad brother or you know whatever. It says just love your brother. Why? Especially if your brother is hard to love because you're going to have to depend on God. And God loves it. When you depend on the second part, it says, he who is in you is greater than he that is in the world. We are already overcomers, remembering that when we receive Christ, we have the Holy Spirit in us. 
And if he's in us, we are overcomers because he is an overcomer. And so we've got to call on that. We need the, the Holy Spirit. God is faithful. If you've not been filled with the Holy Spirit, you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. When you get saved, you have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has you. When you surrender and you get baptized. When you get saved, you have the Holy Spirit. You have a relationship with God and say, God, I need this. God, I need that. God, I want this. God, oh, how come you never answer me that prayer? I don't know if I love you now because you're not answering my prayer. You know, we go through that. But when you got the Holy Spirit, when the Holy Spirit gets you in baptism, you get slain in the Spirit. Some of you say, oh, I don't know what happened. I, you know, they rushed two of my friends to the Emergency room when it happened first. They didn't know what was happening. It's the Holy Spirit wanting to overflow you. Every day be filled with the Holy Spirit. That one experience will not carry you through. Every day let the Holy Spirit have you. Because you know how you know that the Holy Spirit has you? Because now you don't say, give me this, give me that. Why don't you answer my prayer? Da, 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 da. No, no, no. Now you're saying very humbly, what can I do for you, Lord? What can I do for you? Not what you can do for me. And we go through that process of being baptized and sanctified and holy unto him, and it makes our relationship to grow. So remember that the greater one is already in you, and so you're already victorious. Amen? Okay. Then the second thing he says, love God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Then he says, keep my commandments. Keep my commandments. John 14, 15 says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Well, what are his commandments? First of all, let's go back to the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20, and we will shortly finish. Exodus chapter 20. We name the first two. Have no other gods before him. Don't have any graven image of anything and bow down to them. Number three, thou shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who has taken his name in vain. Have you ever sworn using the name of God, of Jesus? You know, I told you once before, I went to Okinawa as a missionary, and they spoke, the Okinawans there spoke mostly Japanese, and we had American soldiers, so they could understand a little bit. But, you know, I was passing a work, road work project, and those men were there, and they were talking, and they swore in the name of Jesus. And I looked, and I thought, they're Buddhists, I think. They don't know about Jesus, and how come they don't swear in the name of Buddha? They're swearing in the name of Jesus. Why? Because the devil hates Jesus. And if you're guilty of doing that, you need to repent. Don't take his name lightly. Don't use it as a slang word. Oh, my God. And it's meaningless. Or spirit-filled people sometimes take God's name in vain by saying, God told me when he didn't. Be careful. You're breaking one of the Ten Commandments. The good thing about God is as soon as you repent of it and truly repent of it, he forgives you and releases you to go on to victory. Number four, remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do your work, but the seventh day is Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you nor your son nor your daughter, the children like this one, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is in your gates. That means your guests. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. And so the Jewish people to this day, their Sabbath is from sundown Friday to sundown Saturday the Sabbath day for them. But they have also a different calendar. The Seventh-day Adventists are very strict about caring, you know, uh, worshiping on the seventh day. That's a day of rest. And so how do we explain this? I say this. First of all, the Sabbath is a rest day. Remember us old-timers, the ones over 95 like me? 
Uh, well, I'm not quite 95 yet, but remember when Saturday and Sunday everybody was off? It was a five-day week. I lived in New Zealand when it was a five-day week. Everything shut down except the neighborhood grocery store in case of emergency. So one day was a day of rest. And then Sunday was a day of worship. I believe Sunday should be a day of worship because in the New Testament, the disciples who saw the resurrection, which was on a Sunday, began worshiping on Sunday. And that's how the tradition came into the Christian church, separating us from Judaism and the Old Testament to celebrate the fulfillment of the Messiah coming and resurrecting to give us hope. So that's why we worship on Sunday. But I believe that if you cannot make Sunday also a day of rest, as I can't, I need to take another day off for rest. If God had to rest after he did all the creation, there must be a divine principle. And I say this, the day of rest, I believe, is God-ordained. And he said, um, he, the Lord rested and blessed the Sabbath and hallowed it. That means there's a blessing on your resting. It's like sleep. I was telling somebody who was having a hard time. I said, sleep is made to repair your body. Rest, Sabbath, is made so that you can be focused. You rest and get focused on worship. But whenever your schedule is, now we've got 24-7 Job, so we're not going to be legalistic, but follow that principle. Follow that principle. If you feel guilty, remember, if, you know, your Sabbath is not today or whatever, it has to be because you work. Remember, in Africa, they probably, it's their Sabbath because there's a different schedule. That's a joke, kind of. But don't worry about the days. Just do it for yourself in obedience to God. Number five, honor your father and your mother that your days may be long upon the earth, a, a land which the Lord God is giving you. Okay, if you came to the Lord late in your life, you probably did not honor your father and mother as you did. did. Just repent. Because you want to cut off disobedience from your children to you. You want to be honored by your children. Repent that you didn't honor your parents. And then, of course, it comes with a promise. You're going to live long, he says. That's a protection. Why? Because godly parents, as they were in the Bible, gave us principles like I had in a Christian family, principles of life. Number six, most of us didn't commit this, I don't think. Thou shalt not murder. Number seven, thou shalt not commit adultery. Number eight, <clears throat> Thou shalt not steal. Number nine, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. That means thou shalt not lie. Number ten, thou shalt not covet your neighbor's house, your neighbor's wife, your neighbor's male servant, your neighbor's female servant, nor his ox or donkey. And I think the ox means in our day, you know, like a tractor. It's, it's a work animal, ox. And I think the donkey is your Cadillac, you know, your vehicle. They didn't have cars, so they had donkeys they rode on, like Mary and Joseph, right? Or anything else that is your neighbor's. The Lord says to be content with whatever you have. St. Paul says, I have learned to be content in whatever state I am. Sometimes he was eating with the, the rulers, and sometimes he was in prison all alone. He said, I'm content. Let me tell you what, if you can be content in Jesus, you're a rich man. Because there are many rich people who have everything in the world but contentment. So if you are content with having Jesus and you are not grumbling about this or that, you are just praising the Lord for wherever you are, whatever you have, you have contentment, you have blessed yourself. So everybody, where you are, say, I'm going to bless myself by being content. Oh, that's about 75% of you. That's wonderful. I think you know Jesus is coming soon. I'm getting a pretty good response. Okay. All right. What are your idols in closing? 
Any of the above? Or sometimes we invent our own. I think our biggest idol is self. I want to do this. You know, will. I will. I don't like to do that. I, I, I. You're your idol. Until you learn to say like Jesus did in the Garden of Gethsemane, not my will, but thine be done. He put will on the altar of the cross. Until you're ready to do that, you are your idol. Oh, Pastor, that's why I don't like you. You're too strict. I want to save you from hell. You cannot go to heaven if you're your own idol. Face it. And the mighty God is so loving to forgive you for making yourself the idol. Your family, your family comes first. I don't know if I can do it. My family, I got to get approval of my family. Listen to God. Your job, you know, those of you who apply for a job say, you know what? I really prefer not to work on Sunday. It's the Lord's Day if you really don't want to work on Sunday. Because I believe even if you don't get it, God knows your heart. He knows your attitude. Some jobs you have to work on Sunday. But God knows your heart is with him and you're honoring him. Your ministry, those of you who are ministry here or myself, you want to build a reputation for yourself? There are a lot of ministers that like to, I'm sorry to say. It's not about us. We cannot be. Don't lean on me. I might fail you. If you're leaning on me and you get discouraged if you know, I do this or encouraged because I do that, you're making me your idol. Don't make me your idol. I don't want to be your idol. That's why I told you all my faults before. <laughs> That's why I try to get you depressed. I'm a human being just like you. Don't lean on the arm of flesh no matter who it is, your mom, your dad, your sister, your brother, or your neighbor, or your teacher, or whoever. Jesus is our God. Don't hang on to your ministry. We only serve him because he's appointed us there. And God wants you to put away all your good luck charms. You got a big cross for good luck? I mean, a lot of people, I see, you know, a big cross. Oh, you're a Christian. No, 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 it's for good luck. Throw it away. Anything that you're putting your trust in for good luck, there's no such thing as good luck. I mean, I say it sometimes, you know. But it's not by luck. Don't insult God. It's not by accident that good things happen. It's by God's great design. If you love him, he's got a plan for you. And whatever happens to you is not bad luck or good luck. It's a journey and trust him Every good and perfect gift comes from him. And if you want to be safe and you want to go to heaven, throw away your idols. Throw away all those good luck things. And start at the cross. Amen. Let's bow our heads. I want the Holy Spirit to disclose to you any idols today that you need to cast down. Because many of us need that promise from God that he gave to us. Therefore let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you except such as common to man. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able. But with what temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Therefore, my beloved, free from idolatry. Father, through your Holy Spirit, reveal to us any idols that we have kept in secret or out in the open. Correct us. Holy Spirit, convict us. And Holy Spirit, help us today to enthrone Jesus the throne of our lives that we will trust him and him alone not the doctors 
not the programs, not the church, not the pastor, not your friends, but Lord, Jesus, you're everything we need, and you're our only God, and we worship you. So as we sing this last song, I want you to just close your eyes and let the Holy Spirit tell you what you've made an idol. Somebody's made a friendship an idol. A lot of people have made their bank account their idol and they're in fear because their idol is being shaken. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your path. We give ourselves to you, Lord. Keep us in the center of your will. Continue to work in us through your Holy Spirit. Give a blessed day to us, your day, and help us this week to be in the center of your will if you should come. We want to be ready. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. If you need prayer, come to the altar before you leave. We'll be glad to pray for you. If not, come back tonight at 7 o'clock. We'll have the famous Barozos here to minister to us. So let's all stand. Greet each other as you leave. Come back tonight. Amen. God bless you. I love you. And we're praying for you out there.